Over the last few weeks, as many of you know, and has been said already this morning, we've been looking at, at the book of John. Um, and we've been looking at Jesus and. So most of them have been at Jesus and one individual person. Last week, Derek spoke and it was Jesus and then two different individual people. So today, we're actually going to look at Jesus and the woman caught in adultery and Jesus and the men caught in hypocrisy from John 8. Um, when you look in, in your Bible, you might find this is labelled in different ways. We have to remember those original la- or the labels were not in the original. Okay, these are labels that people have added. And I had a quick look through different translations and how they labelled this passage. Some of them don't label any passages at all, which is good. Some label most of the passages, but don't label this one because it's a difficult one and they don't know what to put on it. Um, Most of them, though, label it as the woman caught in adultery or something similar. They focus just on her. J.B. Phillips calls it, Jesus deflates the rigorists, which I thought, flip it, what does that mean? Um, But basically it focuses on the leaders, it just focuses on the men. N.T. Wright, though, in his uh, translation, calls it adultery and hypocrisy. He focuses on both. And I think that's actually where our focus should be. Um, So we're going to read the passage. It says, At dawn, he appeared again, this is Jesus, in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who'd heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is a passage I've grown up with, I've heard preached on, I've read many times. Um, And I've also noticed that actually in most of our Bibles it points out that this passage was not in the earliest manuscripts. It probably wasn't there in the beginning. Um, But it has been there for approaching 2,000 years. Um, And it has been accepted as one of the circulating tradition of what Jesus said and what he did. Um, One of the commentaries said, There is no reason to doubt its substantial truth. The saying that it preserves is completely in character with what we know of our Lord and quite out of character with the stern discipline that came to be established in the developing church. So on other hands, by the time we find it in the manuscripts, this was not the way the church tended to treat people, and yet it still stayed because it tied up so much with what they knew of Jesus. So in some ways, this is a timeless story. It doesn't really have context within the book, but it does show us how Jesus treated people. It does show us how he interacted with the leaders, with those that were trying to trap him. So we're going to look at it this morning in three bits. And it's quite nice. They actually fit in the order that they come in the story. Um, So the first bit is setting the scene. Then we're going to look at how Jesus engaged with the Pharisees. And then we're going to have a look at Jesus how engaged with the woman. So I'm going to read each passage. You get each little bit again. So at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. 
In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So there's a whole load of things that I'm going to point out from this. Jesus was in the middle of teaching, and this was an interruption to him. But he didn't allow his agenda to stop him treating people as real humans. He didn't allow his busyness and what he thought was he was doing to stop him from treating her as important and important to address that question. We see here that the leaders, the Pharisees, they have power. This is in the temple. This is kind of their turf. You know, this is where they have power. She has no power. She has no name, no voice. We don't know why she was in this position. We don't know whether she made this choice to have an affair. We don't know whether she was forced into it. We just don't know. But what we do know is that the leaders had not brought both of them. We assume that they know who the man was because she was caught in the act of adultery. Doesn't need much explaining. They knew who he was. He was not there. They wanted to see that law carried out and they were correct in some ways about what the law said. They've cherry-picked it quite a bit. They've twisted it quite a bit. But the basis is there. They ignored the bits that didn't suit them. She hadn't been alone, but she's now facing the consequences of her actions, completely on her own. We don't even know, like I say, whether these were actions that she chose or whether this is something coerced. And she's facing those consequences alone. We don't know whether they'd allowed her to get dressed properly. She could have been there, wrapped in not a lot. The shame, the fear, the humiliation for her must have been horrific. The thing is, their aim was to trap Jesus. It wasn't to see justice done. It wasn't to fulfill the law. Their aim was to trap Jesus. So, are there bits here that you think, I, I identify with that? Having no voice. Are you the one with power and a voice? Are you the one that wants to see things just done right, done by the book? Are you seeing wrongdoing and injustice and wanting someone to pay for that? Are you facing consequences and feeling alone? They might be consequences of things you've done or things that other people have done to you. Are there people trying to interrupt you and you don't want to treat them as important? Are you full of shame, feeling humiliated, frightened? Or are you an onlooker? feeling uninvolved, but just a bit nosy on what's going on. And I think probably all of us will identify with one or more of these statements um, about how this story could be speaking into us, where we potentially would have been in that scenario. So as we're looking through the rest of this, can you see how Jesus deals with all of these things? And obviously in this time, I haven't got time to go through each individually of these. Is God speaking to you in these things? So now we're going to look at how Jesus engaged with the Pharisees. So they'd asked him this question, and Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So Jesus spotted the trap. He was discerning. And I thought, actually, do I pray to be discerning when people ask me questions, when I'm in situations? Is that my first thought? Or is it defend myself? Or is it, oh, I've got to respond, I've got to react? 
Jesus didn't just act. He all, sorry, Jesus didn't react, he acted. The thing is, that trap was that if he denied the law, then they would accuse him of being not godly, not a prophet. If he upheld the law, even in the form that they were putting it forward to him, then that would discredit the rest of his teaching, that love-based life with God. It also probably wasn't actually a punishment that was carried out at this time. So he would have been seen as overly harsh. Also, the Romans could then have arrested him because they were the only ones allowed to put people to death. You know, a whole load of things in this trap. So Jesus bent down to write on the ground. There's been an awful lot of ink spilled in books about what Jesus was writing. But the bottom line is, we do not know. Okay, we don't know what he was writing on the ground. Um, and we don't actually have a, a definitive why either. But what we do know is that Jesus wasn't reacting. He was making deliberate choices. I personally think he may have been praying. He may have been thinking. But he then came back to them and he actually referenced another part of scripture. So they had quoted bits at him. Um, and he quotes back or references Deuteronomy 17 verse 7. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death and then the hands of all the people. They had to be innocent of the crime. So Jesus was saying, okay, if you're going to carry out the law, then you do it, but you do it properly. And of course, they couldn't. They walked away. And I think he was really pointing out their need for innocence too, before you judge. Are we innocent when we try and judge people? He bent down again after he said that. And he didn't, I think to me that really speaks, he wasn't judging. He didn't stand there and stare at them in the eyes and sort of face them down. He just disengaged from that situation and allowed them the space to think, to feel less threatened. Because if he'd stood there and looked at them directly in the eyes, they would have felt threatened. They probably would not have responded in the way they did. And Jesus did not condemn these men. They brought a trap, but he didn't condemn them. He gave them space to reflect and to think. We don't know who was there. We don't know if Nicodemus was there. We don't know if Joseph of Arimathea was there, who later clearly was one of Jesus' followers. We don't know what the response of these people was. This passage just doesn't tell us the response. But we do know that they didn't go ahead with what they were doing, what they had planned. And they didn't trap Jesus. So how did Jesus engage with the woman? Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Women, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So when he was speaking with those who were powerful, he didn't come back at them strongly in that way. He didn't stare them down. And yet when he was interacting with someone vulnerable and scared, he spoke personally to her. He spoke with her as an individual. He treated her as a human, not a pawn in some nasty game. He didn't treat her as dirt or as guilty. He didn't shame her. He didn't allow her sin to define her. Jesus doesn't allow our sin to define who we are. He didn't condemn her. She might have made a conscious choice to sleep with someone who wasn't a husband. We don't know. She might not have felt she had a choice. The thing is, when we condemn people... That shuts people down. When we love people and give them dignity, it gives them a space to make a choice. Jesus gives us space to make a choice because he does not condemn us. God does not condemn any one of us. Jesus didn't actually treat her as powerless. 
The men had treated her as completely powerless. She was vulnerable, but Jesus actually gave her agency and gave her a voice. He allowed her the dignity of knowing that on this occasion, even if that was the only occasion in her life that she was ever given a choice, it was actually her choice. And that was offered from a place of compassion. Jesus actually treated her as equal to the scribes and Pharisees. How must that have made her feel? How would that have made me feel? If I was there feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, feeling all sorts of fear, and I was treated the same way as someone who was powerful, the same way as someone who actually had a voice and had agency. That is so beautiful. Jesus, and um, he allowed her the actual dignity of actually answering for herself. She had a voice suddenly. You know, he didn't turn around and say, they haven't condemned you, nor do I, which would have been absolutely fine in some ways. But he actually allowed her to say it out loud. How much more powerful do we feel when we say these things for ourselves? Actually, no, God. Nobody's condemned me. Or you're not condemning me, God. That is really powerful. But imagine what that meant to her to hear, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Did that give her hope? Did that help her feel that there were real choices to make? That she had the power to make those choices? It didn't mean it was easy. But with hope, I think we can change things. When we feel hopeless, we feel trapped. We feel that we can't change anything. Things don't change. Are we bringing people hope? We've got a big sign outside. And a couple of times in the last six months, I've talked to somebody and they've commented, oh, that's the church that's got hope outside. That's the church with the big lights that says hope. Yeah. Hope gives us power to change. And when we receive love and compassion and not condemnation, we have that power to change. And I think that's what Jesus did over and above everything for this lady. And again from the commentary it says release from life contrary to the will of God is always with a view to life according to the will of God there is that sense of actually when we are released and we're freed it is so that we can go and live life according to the will of God we can go and live that life free of sin and anyone that's claiming to be completely free of sin this morning is not me okay but we can aim that way we can live that life with that aim with that purpose because of that and you know I think for me I know that at times I don't feel like I have the power to change things in me and yet I know that I've had opportunities to chat and to talk without someone coming back and condemning me And without someone saying, oh, you're wrong. Just giving me that space. And I know that I've then actually seen things in my life change. And that's been really, really powerful to me. And we need to be in that position where we are giving people that space. We are giving people that love, that lack of condemnation to be able to change. Many times this, this story has been used to crush people. Um, and yet, you know, actually people will even use like verse 7, you know, that he is without sin, cast the first stone, to point out hypocrisy within the church usually. Um, but actually, what are the bits that I need to hold on to, um, you know, that are really important Um, the bits in the law, the bits in Jesus' teaching that are really important, and which are the bits where I need to say, actually, no, this is 
this is somewhere where we can show love, we can show compassion, we can show grace and mercy. We can show justice, mercy, faithfulness. Now, Sue talked a couple of weeks ago about the woman at the well. And we, we saw there that there was a change. Um, but with this woman, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened to the men. We see Jesus calling her to a new and a better life. We, did see, we see that Jesus didn't condemn either the woman or the man. He offered grace and mercy to both of them. Jesus gave them all space to think, to change. He treated people as humans, whether they were in the right or the wrong, according to whatever standards you want to set for that. So, this morning, what can we learn? Jesus does not condemn us. But he doesn't also want us to stay as we are. And we are not to condemn other people. We're also not to use other people for our purposes. These Pharisees, these leaders, were trying to use this woman to trap Jesus. Whatever our purposes are, we're not to use other people for that. Um, and actually this morning we can learn to give people space to give people hope to give them a place to change rather than shame when we shame people they run away when we feel shame we hide we don't come and see what God is going to do through us we don't see that change we don't feel we've got hope to change Jesus gave this woman a hope and therefore a future. As I say, we don't know how it works out in her life. But I'm not going to apply this specifically. You know, you may feel like you're in one of those many places that I said at the beginning from this story. Um, but you need to work out how this applies in your life. Jesus doesn't condemn us. We're not to condemn others. But God does give us that space and that hope to change. So I'm going to pray and then I think Esther's going to lead us into communion. Jesus, I thank you for the real beauty of how you dealt with both these groups of people. That you didn't condemn. You gave everybody in this scenario opportunities to change Lord I thank you that you give every one of us here this morning an opportunity to change to move into where you're going to move into the ways that, that are just following your love that are following your way of life Lord I pray that this morning we would see ways that we can become more like you that we can follow you more truly Help us to treat people in a way that gives them the space to do that too. Amen.